This is a biopod, an innovative system that allows us to generate free insect proteins and fats for our chickens using food waste, coffee grounds, and even manure. Thanks to the biopod, we can produce our own protein-rich chicken feed. We recently posted a video about the biopod on social media, and we were overwhelmed with questions about the system, along with many other circular system questions. We are thrilled to have received so many questions from you all, our community members, about the sustainable systems we use and promote here. In this Q&A video, we will answer all of your questions about the biopod and all the other circular systems we have here. Our mission is to educate and inspire individuals to live a more sustainable lifestyle. We believe that by sharing our own experiences and knowledge, we can help others make a positive change in their lives at a local level. This video has been divided into segments, each focusing on a specific circular system. This way, you can easily find the answers to the questions you are most interested in. We will first explain what each system does, then address the most popular questions related to that system. The first system we'll go over is the biopod. A biopod is an enclosed, self-contained system designed for the purpose of raising black soldier fly larvae from food waste, with the aim of producing a high-protein food source for chickens and other livestock. Biopod typically consist of a series of stacked trays or chambers, each containing a substrate of food waste and a colony of black soldier fly eggs or larvae. The larvae consume the food waste and grow rapidly, providing a highly nutritious protein source that can be harvested and fed to livestock. The biopod is designed to be a self-sustaining system with the larvae producing frass that can be used as fertilizer and the adult flies emerging from the pupa to continue the life cycle. Biopods are an efficient and sustainable method of producing protein for animal feed and are increasingly being used in both commercial and backyard farming operations. Question one. Do we feed the white larvae to the chicken or the black ones? The black larvae are ideal. You can feed both to chickens, but we aim to collect as many black larvae as possible and let the white larvae grow. As they mature, they produce more protein and more fat for the chickens. The white larvae are not yet fully matured. Question two. How often do you exchange the grounds? And what are the ideal moisture levels for inside the tote? We typically change the grounds about once per season, which is about once per year. The black soldier fly will eat the coffee grounds if other food sources are not available. The coffee grounds make a good backup food source. You can use manure, but we really recommend getting coffee grounds as they smell a lot nicer and you can get them for free from local coffee shops. You want the substrate, the coffee grounds, to be damp and moist. Not soupy, but not too dry. Question three. My chickens are in a small backyard coop. We don't have a ton of space and I don't want to attract flies to our backyard area, but I love this idea. My question is, does it smell and does it attract a lot of flies that linger around the area? When managed correctly, the biopod won't smell bad more than one to two feet away. You may get some other flies at first, but once the black soldier flies establish a colony, the other flies will disappear. The black soldier flies also eat the food very fast. So whereas the smell of the food on the inside might be strong at first, it will disappear. Question four, do you have any plans on the build and set up for the DIY biopod that you could share? Not yet, but we are planning on releasing some plans very soon. Question five, do snakes get into the biopod? While we have not had that issue, technically it could happen, but it's not something we've ever seen. Question six, could I make money selling the grubs I harvest from biopods? Probably. Grubly is a company that does just that. Grubly is a company in Atlanta, Georgia that was founded by two Georgia Tech students. They take food waste from other restaurants and businesses, raise black soldier flies, and sell them as chicken snacks. Question seven, does the biopod work in Montana? During the warm months, most likely. We don't have a land lab in Montana. However, black soldier flies are native to most of North America and breed during the warm months. For us, that starts about late April to early May. You can check out Paul Wheaton's work on Montana as he has many cool permaculture concepts tested in that climate. Question eight, can you make a long form video on your DIY biopod? Absolutely, we'll be releasing that video this spring. Question nine, is the cardboard you use for the biopods toxic? We use cardboard that is not printed with colored ink. The color inks and some other glues are the ones with the toxic elements in them. We feel good about using brown, non-printed cardboard from shipping boxes. The next system we'll be going over is the rainwater collector. A rainwater collector is a system that collects and stores rainwater for later use. It typically consists of a series of components, including a collection surface, such as a roof, gutters, downspouts, a storage tank, and a filtration system. The collected rainwater can be used for a variety of purposes, such as irrigation, flushing toilets, washing clothes, and even for drinking after treatment. Rainwater harvesting can be an effective way to conserve water and reduce dependence on municipal water supplies. 
Question one, can you drink the water? Only if you purify it. We use a purifier that's powered by solar, but you can also use a Berkey, a ceramic filter, a carbon filter, iodine, along with other solutions. Don't drink rainwater straight from the collector, as it could have chemicals, bird poop, bugs, dirt, and other impurities. Plants can drink it straight. You should not. Question two, how much does it cost? Depends on how big of a system you install. If you can find reclaimed gutters, food grade water tanks, and hardware, it could cost zero dollars. We spent about $650 on our 550 gallon IBC tiny house rainwater collecting system. The used food grade IBC totes are about $100 to $200. The gutter materials are usually under $75 and the PVC pipes and fittings can typically range between $50 to $100. Our small 120 gallon garden setup costs about $160 for both barrels and $30 for the vinyl gutters. Roughly $200 for a smaller system. This is a good size for a personal backyard or small garden. Our 550 gallon system is good for our land lab, which sits on a quarter acre. Question three, how much rainwater can I expect? It depends on three factors. What's the average rainfall in your area? How big is your roof collection area? How much water storage can your tanks handle? First measure the square footage of your collection area. For example, if you have a roof 20 feet by 40 feet, that's 800 square feet. Then multiply that number by the average rainfall you get. For example, if you get two inches of rainfall a month, that number is now 1600. Now multiply that by 0 0.623. I can now expect 996.8 gallons of water a month. The next system we'll be going over is biochar. Biochar is a type of charcoal that is produced from biomass, such as wood chips, agriculture waste, or other organic matter through a process that is called pyrolysis. Pyrolysis involves heating the biomass in the absence of oxygen, which produces a solid, carbon-rich material that can be used for a variety of purposes. Biochar is typically characterized by its high porosity, which gives it a large surface area and makes it an effective medium for water retention and nutrient exchange in soil. When a Applied to soil, biochar can improve soil fertility, water retention, and plant growth, and also sequester carbon from the atmosphere for long periods of time, making it a potential tool for climate change mitigation. Biochar is also used in various industrial applications such as water treatment, energy production, and as a filter for air and water purification. Question one, how often do I mix biochar into my soil? This is an inexact science and art for us. Many gardeners and researchers recommend using five to 10% biochar in the top six inches of soil. This roughly comes out to about a gallon every four square feet. Question two, can I add it as is or does it need inoculation? Biochar acts like a sponge for nutrients. If you don't inoculate it, the biochar will suck all the nutrients out of your soil and you'll end up just harming your garden instead of helping it out. But by putting it first into your compost or introducing it to liquid fertilizer, it'll soak up all that nutrients and then give that nutrients to your soil. Adding inoculated biochar every growing season is a good idea. You always want to inoculate your biochar with plenty of nutrients. Liquid fertilizer is especially great for this. Another way to do it is to mix your biochar into your compost a few months before you plan on using the biochar. Urea works as well. Question three, do I add water to it? Yes, make sure it stays moist to ensure it stays inoculated. You also wanna crush it up finely. Question four, does the feedstock have to have bone in it? No, biochar from just wood is absolutely fine. Question five, does it make a lot of smoke? If you operate your fire pit and biochar system correctly and ensure all your feedstock is completely dry, the smoke will be minimal to non-existent. The next system we'll go over is the birdhouse system. Birdhouses for insect pest control are structures designed to attract birds to an area in order to control the population of insect pests. These birdhouses are typically constructed with specific features that make them attractive to certain bird species, which which in turn are natural predators of insects. For example, birdhouses designed for bluebirds often have a small entrance hole and an open floor, while those for wrens have a larger entrance hole and a closed floor. The design of the birdhouse will depend on the types of birds and insects present in the area, as well as the specific pest control needs of the environment. By providing a safe and comfortable nesting space for these birds, they are more likely to stay in the area and prey on insects, helping to naturally control their populations. Question one, how effective are they? To be perfectly transparent, we would need to set up another garden without them to a B test. Our rule of thumb is that any kind of biodiversity for the garden is good. We do see the birds eat plenty of bugs that would normally eat our vegetation. Question two. Do the birds eat your vegetation? Not here in our garden. They don't seem interested in what we grow. We have mostly bluebirds. Question three, do you lose worms? If we do, we don't notice a lack of worms at all. Our composting has massively increased our worm activity. Question four, don't bluebirds fend off other nesting birds? They are known for this, but it doesn't seem to be an issue for us. We have plenty of bluebirds here. The next system we'll go over is solar. 
Photovoltaic panels, also known as solar panels, are devices that convert sunlight into electricity. They are made up of multiple photovoltaic cells, which are semiconductor materials that absorb photons from the sun and release electrons, creating electric current. The electric current generated by the PV panels can be used to power homes, businesses, and other electrical appliances. PV panels are a form of renewable energy as they use a clean and abundant source of energy, the sun to produce electricity without emitting harmful greenhouse gases or pollutants. Question one, how much energy does it give you all? Both solar panel systems we use use 400 watts of photovoltaic panels. This gives us a max of 0.4 kilowatts per hour captured by each system of panels. Our solar generator stores about one kilowatt hour of electricity. Question two, what does it power? We are able to charge power tools, run fans and lights, power our sensors and cameras, power our table saw for a while, and run water pumps. Question three, how long does the panel last? Solar panels typically last about 25 years. Question four, how much was it? Our first 400 watt system with a one kilowatt hour battery plus the inverter cost about $1,400. Question five, how much sunlight is needed. A few hours of direct sunlight can charge the battery when it's not being used. If it's being used, the battery will last a few hours up to a full day, depending on how much energy we're using. The next system we'll be going over is compost. Compost is a type of organic matter that has been decomposed and transformed into a nutrient-rich soil amendment that is beneficial for plants. Composting is a natural process that occurs when microorganisms, such as bacteria and fungi, break down organic materials, such as food scraps, yard waste, and other plant matter. Compost is commonly used in gardening, landscaping, and agriculture to improve soil fertility, increase plant growth, and reduce the need for chemical fertilizers. Question one, why does the compost get so hot? Microbes breaking down the biomass generate heat. Compost can get up to 160 degrees Fahrenheit. You want your compost hot, but no hotter than 160 degrees Fahrenheit. Question two, what is best for compost? You wanna mix browns and greens to make a good compost. Browns are carbon heavy. Leaves, shredded paper, shredded cardboard, and dried grasses and other biomass. Greens are nitrogen heavy. Fresh grass, weeds, liquid fertilizer, and coffee, to name a few. You want roughly a 30 to one brown to green ratio, carbon to nitrogen. You can also add biochar and food waste to your compost. You want to always ensure your compost is damp, but not soggy or dry. Question three. What is not good in compost? Some natural elements like sticks, pine cones, wood chips, bones, meat, and oils are not recommended for compost as they take a long time to break down. And the meats and oils will attract pests. Other elements can be toxic to your compost as well, such as plastic, metal, foam, chemicals, paint, or any other synthetic chemical. These things should never be composted. The next system we'll be going over is compost rollers. Compost rollers are cylindrical devices used to make composting more efficient. They are typically made of metal or plastic and have a handle or crank on each end for easy turning. Compost rollers are designed to be filled with organic waste materials, such as food scraps, yard trimmings, and other biodegradable materials. As the roller is turned, the materials inside are mixed and aerated, which helps to break down the organic matter and speed up the composting process. Compost rollers are useful for small-scale composting in urban or suburban settings, where space may be limited, as they take up less space than traditional compost bins and can be easily moved from one location to another. Question one, what does the rolling capability do for the compost compared to traditional compost piles. The compost rollers make it easy to turn the compost without a pitchfork or shovel, which can take some muscle. The compost rollers also keep the compost out of sight, which might be required in an HOA or on a patio. They also minimize any compost smells or insect issues. But if a compost pile is done right, it can actually smell sweet and pleasant. We like to use the compost rollers to make compost inoculate. It allows us to get microbes into other batches of compost that have been newly created. The next system we'll be going over is the liquid fertilizer. Anaerobic liquid fertilizer is a type of organic fertilizer that is made by fermenting organic matter in the absence of oxygen. This process is known as anaerobic digestion and it breaks down the organic matter into a liquid form that can be used as a nutrient rich fertilizer for plants. Anaerobic liquid fertilizer is typically made using materials such as manure, kitchen waste, or other organic matter that would otherwise go to waste. The resulting liquid fertilizer is high in nutrients such as nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, which are essential for plant growth and health. Anaerobic liquid fertilizer is commonly used in organic farming and gardening as a natural alternative to synthetic fertilizers. Question one, how effective is this compared to store-bought? We have plans to make a nutrient analysis in the future. We currently don't have this data, but last year we did produce over a thousand pounds of produce from this quarter acre land lab alone using the liquid fertilizer and compost. That seems like good 
good results to us. Our homemade liquid fertilizer is full of microbes and really builds the soil up. Store-bought NPK fertilizer can burn out the soil, kill microbes, and reduce topsoil by killing mycelium and other microorganisms. We always aim to make more life in soil than kill it, since soil is a living thing. Question two. How long do I let it sit? We let our liquid fertilizer brew for a few weeks to allow the anaerobic bacteria to consume all the plant nutrients. Question three, how do I make bone meal? You can bake or boil bones to make them fragile and then grind them up into a powder. The next system we'll be going over is the methane digester. An anaerobic methane digester or biogas digester is a specialized system that uses anaerobic digestion to break down organic waste and produce biogas, a renewable energy source composed mainly of methane and carbon dioxide. It operates in the absence of oxygen and uses microorganisms to break down organic material, such as agricultural waste, food scraps, and sewage, to produce biogas. The biogas can then be used as fuel for electricity generation or heating, and the remaining waste can be used as fertilizer. Anaerobic methane digesters are a sustainable solution for waste management and renewable energy production. Question 1. How often does a unit like this methane digester need to be serviced or cleaned? What sort of maintenance would I be looking at? Ideally, never. We've had both of our digesters running really well for about a year. Both are operating really well 12 months in. But we'll definitely let you all know if we end up having to clean them out. But as long as you run them correctly and only put in what is allowed, everything will be turned into liquid fertilizer or methane with nothing left over. Question two, how can we purchase the methane digester? You can check out the methane digester listing at liveoakcs.com. Question three, how does the methane digester work in cold temps? The methane digester needs an average temperature of 68 degrees Fahrenheit to operate at full capacity. We've run ours in colder weather and it can operate as long as the daytime temps get it back up. This greenhouse allows us to run the digester year round as it keeps the average temperature higher. If you're using a methane digester in the winter, you will have to shut it down if you don't have a greenhouse. Question four, does a methane digester gas work in a propane stove? The cooktop we use is almost identical to a propane cooktop. You could likely retrofit fit the propane cooktop with the right connectors to work on methane. But we have not tried this yet, so try this at your own risk. Question five, do food scraps alone feed the system? Yes, once the system is active and set up properly. To activate the system, it needs to be filled up with water. And then fresh herbivore manure needs to be mixed in as well, usually cow manure. This activates the digester with methogens, which is microbes and bacteria. That breaks down the food scraps and releases the methane. The methane digester is essentially acting like a giant cow stomach. It's a great example of biomimicry. Question six, would the methane digester work in Vermont? During the warmer months, absolutely. Our digesters work very well year around in our southern climate of Georgia, but we definitely need the greenhouse to help with that during the winters. Methane digesters can work year round outside in a tropical environment. In Vermont, a greenhouse would be ideal to maximize the amount of months that the digester can run. Question seven. Can I use pig manure for the methane digester? And would it work in the Northeast? While it's not ideal compared to cow manure, we have seen other people use it and it does work. We have not tried it ourselves, but like I said, it should work. Methane digesters can work in the Northeast, but only for a small time frame. Question eight, what is the ratio between water and cow waste for the methane digester? You want a one-to-one -one ratio of 100 liters of manure to 100 liters of water to form the slurry to activate the methane digester. Question nine, does the heat contribute to a higher rate of methane production? Yes, the warmer months help increase the methane production. Colder temps will slow and eventually end production. Adding biochar can also increase the methane production inside the digester. Question 10, do you guys have a DIY methane digester or do I need to just buy one? We haven't built a DIY methane digester yet, but we will soon. There are some other resources online that we'll link below. Question 11, can I use goat manure for the methane digester? Yes, manure from cows, horses, pigs, sheep, and goats can work, but not chickens. Here are the remaining popular questions we got that don't fall under a specific category. Question one, where are you located? Southeastern USA, Georgia. Question two, do you sell the Sterling engine? You can email us at hello at liveoakcs.com for more information. Question three, how do I set these systems up? Do y'all do consulting? In addition to producing these videos, we're building land lab courses to show you how all of these systems work and how you can build them to create an off-grid living system. We'll be releasing our first few courses this summer of 2023. We'll start offering consulting late fall of this year as well. Question four, how do I invest in your company? Once again, you can email us for more partnership information. Question five, 
Do you guys offer any internship programs? Not currently, but we do have an invite-only Discord server for those who are interested in working with us in the future. To get more information about the Discord, you can email us. The land lab here is only a quarter of an acre, but our bigger facility sits on seven acres. And when the seven acres is open, we will have a better chance at opening up internships and more partnerships. Question six, any chance you have tips for growing on balconies and neat ways of using a small amount of space? Start small, use fabric grow bags, use compost rollers, use hanging pots, and enjoy growing herbs and composting. You could even grow some black soldier flies or worms on a balcony. Joel Salatin recommends having a pet chicken instead of a canary or parrot. Chickens don't need much space and they give you fresh eggs. If you get an apartment chicken, let us know. Thank y'all so much for watching this Q&A video. We really enjoyed putting it together for you all and answering all of your questions. We'll be making Q&As every few months just to keep you updated on all of your questions. Thank y'all so much for watching. Take care.